I'm James Turk of Gold Money, and it's my pleasure to be speaking today with Felix Marina de la Cova, who's a commodity, foreign exchange, and equity trader, and also a contributor to the Gold Money website. Felix, pleasure to be speaking with you today. I'd like to talk about competitive currencies um, in general, um, and I also want to talk a little bit about some of the competitive currencies that are out there, like Bitcoin. Um, you know, I've recently contributed something to the uh, Gold Money website discussing Bitcoin, and I, I know that you're an advocate of Bitcoin. Uh, I'm in favor of competitive currencies. Um, I have some question marks about Bitcoin. I'd like to explore that with you. Uh, what is the attractiveness to Bitcoin in, in your view? I want to see what your thoughts are and where we agree and maybe where we disagree. Well, first of all, uh, James, it's an absolute pleasure to be here talking to you. you. I've always been a great fan. And um, the thing about Bitcoin, well, the thing about competitive currencies in general is that by nature, there's going to be a lot of different options and lots of different uh, products out there for people to choose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Bitcoin um, has a lot of value. Uh, basically, the, the, the idea itself is genius. The purpose is to try to do um, for money and for internet payments what email has done for communications or what blogs have done for journalism. And uh, the way it does it is very, very innovative and uh, deserves a careful look. I know you have some doubts, obviously, and uh, you've spoken uh, a bit about them, but uh, I really think it's worth looking at. Um, the first thing you have to understand that Bitcoin is three things. It's the blockchain, the protocol, and, and, um, and the client, the actual program that runs Bitcoin. The client's not important at all. In fact, the client's not even the better version. And there's alternative clients which have been developed by the people which actually work better than the original Satoshi client. Uh, the blockchain is the record of transactions, which is what ensures that people don't double spend the Bitcoins. And it's sort of, you could call it the history of, um, the, of Bitcoin. And that's probably going to stick around for a long time, even if Bitcoin doesn't succeed or is replaced by something better. The idea of having a public record of all transactions um, is such a genius idea and such a great way to use distributed networking and P2P networking to stop um, and decentralized, um, a decentralized system of stopping double spending. It's such a genius idea that that's going to, we'll see it again in many, many other uses. And the main thing, the actual protocol, is such a perfect example of Hayek's emerging order because it's, um, it's a completely voluntary protocol. It's like a language, like a programming language or like a regular language that uh, people agree to use for payments in this case. Yes. Could be for other stuff, it could be for software, but in this case it's for payments. And the actual, um, the actual protocol is the DNA of Bitcoin and it's so well designed, it's almost designed by a gold bug because it emulates the way that gold became money. Um, I know you're going to bring up Mises' regression theorem, obviously. No, I'm not going to bring up Mises. <laughs> I'll bring up something a little bit more fundamental. Um, yeah, first of all, I recognize the points that you're making, and I do think that the preventing the double spend was a, a brilliant um, advancement in the nature of currency. And I take my hat off to Mr. Was it Yakamoto or Sakamoto? Yakamoto. Yeah, yeah, for you know uh, the the creativity and the brilliance in what he's put together. Where I have issues with is the fact that Bitcoin is not a tangible asset. Um, you know, if I have a, a piece of silver in my hand or a piece of gold, it's a tangible asset. And if I use that to purchase from you a, a, an asset or some good or service, the exchange is extinguished at the moment that those assets are exchanged for one another. You're giving a tangible asset in return for a tangible asset. But what's happened in the last you know, a few hundred years, is currency has moved from being a tangible asset to being a financial asset. And a financial asset has counterparty risk. There's someone's promise uh, that this currency is going to have value in the future. Of and course, but how can you use a tangible asset online? There's well, you use them online with gold money. The <laughs> tangible asset stays in the vault, mm -hmm. and the ownership of that tangible asset transfers instantaneously when you click it from your holding to someone else's holding, which is the nature of the patents uh, that were eventually you know, granted to me. Because what, what we've done with digital gold currency is we've created a new type of currency. It enables gold to circulate 
without having the payment risk that's associated with having a currency that is itself not a tangible asset. And that's, that's the issue that I have with, with let me explain it a little bit more. Um, you know, when I was, um, back in the early 1970s, I lived and worked in, in Thailand. And uh, I didn't speak Thai, but I could go to upcountry Thailand and go into a restaurant with a silver coin or go to a merchant and buy you know, food with a silver coin. And we could communicate with one another. I would get uh, the, the food from the, the merchant and they would get the silver coin and the exchange was extinguished. Um, but if I went up there with uh, a diamond uh, or you know, other tangible assets that are not easily understood or easily to, to value uh, in, in general, uh, transaction wouldn't be done wouldn't be completed. Now, I, I'm not a programmer, and so I don't understand all of the ins and outs of, of, of Bitcoin. I understand fundamentally, but I haven't actually read the programming to see how beautiful it is as people describe it to me, uh, who are programmers. So, you know, I, I have a hard time, you know, conceptualizing and, 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 and seeing, you know, Bitcoin from that light, given my orientation towards tangible assets and, as a form of currency. And I agree with you. I mean, um, you're right when you say Bitcoin is not backed by anything tangible. You're completely right. The only thing that Bitcoin is backed by is demand, the amount of people who agree to use the same protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, the, the one thing that you would appreciate, even without being a programmer, about why Bitcoin, the Bitcoin protocol is so beautiful is the way that it creates artificial scarcity by, yeah. by limiting the amount of Bitcoins that can be produced. Yes, that's, understood. That's just like thing. gold. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. Just like but gold. see, gold is, the, the scarcity comes from the fact that it's dispersed in the Earth's crust in such a way that even though technology adva advances over the years, the gold is harder to find and harder to mine because it's becoming more and more, uh, it's going into deeper locations uh, or, you know, we're, we're trying to extract gold at a smaller grade than, you know, the, the old timers did, you know, mm -hmm. 40, 50, 60 years ago. So uh, there are a lot of similarities, but at the end of the day, Bitcoin is not a tangible asset, but it has tangible nature to it in the sense that um, uh, the programming itself has, has some value, um, but it, it's not like it's something you can put in your hand. The, the other point that you made though that is, is the similarity to gold is that uh, it's how people perceive it. Uh, and that gets back to Austrian economics that um, value is subjective. You know, the old saying goes, one man's treasure is another man's junk. Um, you know, some people might like a particular artist and other people might say, well, that artist is terrible. Uh, and you know, one guy might pay a you know, million dollars for a Picasso and another guy would say, I wouldn't pay a penny for a Picasso. Isn't that also true with currencies and that's the beauty for competing currencies? That is the beauty for competing currencies. But the thing about Bitcoin is that, uh, well, firstly, it's completely decentralized. I mean, with, uh, with a payment system backed by gold or backed by someone, you always have to trust the issuer. Yes. It's always going to be a central record and that makes it vulnerable, but also less flexible than a decentralized system. Basically, to shut down Bitcoin, you need to shut down the internet. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also, you could say, I mean, um, the, way, the, the way that Bitcoin was created by, mainly by programmers was um, based on thing, things like protocols, like HTML, like uh, programming languages, like email. And that is actually, that is actually a fairly good backing because, uh, because they can see they can see where they come from, they can see how many Programmers could see that, but the average guy in the street like me cannot. But the average guy in the street uh, doesn't need to know how things work. He just needs to be able to use them easily. There's a huge demand for online cash. Not a credit system, not a payment system, cash. Something that can be used just as easily as I can buy um, something with well, one euro or one dollar at a store. That does not exist right now, that demand is not being met and uh, Bitcoin is one of the leading solutions trying to meet that demand and if it succeeds, it will be very difficult to, to beat. Yeah, I understand the, the reasons for online cash and the need for online cash and I'm in complete agreement with you there that we do need a product. Um, but ag again, I want to just come back to this point. How, how, does, how do you get people to accept Bitcoin as, as a form of currency where they're going to put some wealth in uh, and uh, you know, take the risks of owning bit, bit, Bitcoin? 
Well, I would advise anyone to own a great deal of Bitcoins right now because it's still in very early stages. It's still very speculative. It's very volatile. Um, in fact, I think volatile that's volatile meaning that its exchange, exchange rate exchange relative rate. to national currencies can go up and down. Exactly. Exactly. It can move a lot right now because it doesn't have enough critical mass. Right now, it's already very useful as a payment system. In fact, I think it combines extremely well with gold. People could save in gold, hold wealth in gold, but then when they have to move, they're not going to move the gold from one country to another. They can just send some bitcoins and buy the gold at the other country. It's so simple. It can already be done. Yeah. Or in theory, just leave the gold in the vault uh, and use gold money to click their ownership of gold to someone else and the gold still stays there. Of course, uh, James, although, but they can't know, do that right now. Well, they, ca they can if they live in Jersey because uh, we haven't st stopped the payments um, everywhere. Um, we're still doing that and hopefully at some point in time in the future when the regulatory environment improves, we'll be able to reestablish that service. But I suppose that's part of the beauty of Bitcoin and more generally competitive currencies that um, you know, here is a currency that uh, has developed a successful following, um, apparently is growing based on the numbers I see, and it's managed to do that without any government regulation. In spite of it, I would say. But let, let me give you an example. Yeah, Argentina, I agree with you on that. Argentina just um, blocked PayPal payments. Um, Argentine citizens can no longer make a pay, uh, PayPal transaction from one account to another account in Argentina. Uh, well, Bitcoin bypasses all that. Who cares what they say? Who cares what the regulation says? It has no country. It has no central place that can be regulated. It's just a network. And just the same as BitTorrent hasn't been shut down despite a massive onslaught from, um, from the record industry, Bitcoin can't be shut down. Yeah. There was just recently a, a failure of one of the big exchanges between Bitcoin and national currencies. And we've seen this before. There was another big failure a couple of years ago, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, how does uh, an exchange provider who makes this market in Bitcoin and currencies establish himself um, and get the market to accept him as, a, as an intermediary between currency and, and Bitcoin? Well, as you know, the biggest Bitcoin exchange, Mt. Gox, is uh, domiciled in Japan. So they don't have any problem. Obviously, most of their clients are in the States, but they're domiciled in Japan. But, um, but that's where the vulnerability is. I mean, the exchanges, the actual, they have to set up companies, they have, to, they have to have a presence. So that is a vulnerable point of Bitcoin, just as it is for any other online, online payment system. But the thing is that Bitcoin can work without them. Mm -hmm. They're useful, they add value, they add liquidity, but you don't need them. Yeah, it's peer-to-peer, -peer. it's 100% peer-to-peer. Well, the, the, to me, what I really like about Bitcoin is it's pushing the edge of the envelope. It's causing people to think. It's causing people to understand that, hey, there's more out there than just something that comes from a government central bank uh, or a government, you know, more generally, that, you know, the market can create alternatives. And that's where the competitive currency thing comes in. You know, in the States, Ron Paul has pushed forward this competitive currency thing that basically unleashes the forces of the free market unleashes entrepreneurial spirit and thinking to create different alternatives to come up with a currency that re reduces the impediments to interacting with one another. And so in that regard, I think Bitcoin you know, has been um, in the forefront of creating something new and creative, and therefore I take my hats off to it. But for the time being, I still have this stumbling block that uh, it's a computer program as opposed to you know, a, a tangible asset that has a 5,000 year history uh, that I can put in my hand and know how to value. But um, I'll probably be looking at it more and more and watch its growth uh, and, and see how it, uh, uh, how it grows and how it deals with the, the issues of becoming a, you know, a new currency and competing in this world where government regulation is becoming more and more of an um, a, a, a impediment. Uh, to the free flow of money and capital across borders. A any final thoughts you'd like to add on this? Yes, I agree with you that nothing can beat gold's 6,000-year-old um, history of use as money. But you use email. You in you've only been using it for the past I don't know, 20 years max. Um, Bitcoin might not be the be-all and end-all, but it's a very valid experiment. And, as you say, a great illustration of how experimentation, competitive currencies, 
can allow all kinds of solutions to spring forth, and I hope to see many more. Yeah, let, let me just end on one thing that I think fits in with our general conversation, and it's a point that I've made time and again, but I think it's really sort of important, particularly in view of this conversation. I distinguish between money on the one hand and currency on the other. Um, you know, money doesn't have any history. It does the same thing today that it did a thousand years ago, or two thousand, or five thousand years ago. It enables us to communicate value with one another when we interact with one another in society. So th that's what money does. It's a mental tool, as Misi described it. Uh, Misi's the you know the great Austrian economist. Currency, on the other hand, does have a history. It evolves and changes. And up until 1694, with the creation of the Bank of England, currency was always a tangible asset. But after that, currency became a financial asset, which has counterparty risk and payment risk and all these other issues. So, you know, currency has continues to evolve, and I think Bitcoin is an important step in the involvement evol uh, as currency evolves, uh, in bringing modern technology to bear in a form of um, a, a payment mechanism that you know the world has never seen before, and I think that's a very, very positive step. But the question I have in my own mind is going back to what we had prior to 1694, where currency is once again a tangible asset, and you know ultimately that's the vision I have for gold money, using a tangible asset once again as currency without eliminating the eliminating the counterparty risk and the payment risk associated with it. So. I don't know. I will see. I'm not a, uh, I, I look forward to very healthy competition between different possible solutions. Oh, well, that I agree with completely, and I really hope that um, you know, governments around the world do take this competitive currency initiative that we're starting to see in a number of different places, take it seriously, allow different currencies to circulate uh, without government intervention, without impediments imposed on the free market, without impediments imposed on individuals exercising their individual choice and, and free will. Uh, Felix, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with me. I really do appreciate it. Felix Moreno de la Cova, uh, thank you again. A pleasure. Visit us at www.goldmoney.com and click on the sign up button to open your free holding.